So last week we read about it taking 25 years for God to fulfill his promise to Abraham and Sarah that they would have a child. But we learned that God was faithful to his word. They did have a child. That child was named Isaac. Well, Isaac marries Rebecca, and they have twin boys, Esau and Jacob. Now, God has promised both Abraham and Isaac that they will have more descendants than stars in the sky, than grains of sand on the earth. So it seems we're still on a snail pace here with Abraham having one child and Isaac having two. So Esau is the firstborn twin, meaning he is in line for the birthright and the blessing of the firstborn son. Jacob is born second, holding on to Esau's heel. Indeed, his name means seizing the heel, or following behind, or the one who supplants. Now, before they were born even, Rebecca felt this struggle between them within her womb. And there's a lot of struggling and wrestling going on in this story. God lets Rebecca in on the plan, saying that the two babies and her represent two nations, and the older one will serve the younger one. Most unusual in the day. So perhaps maybe because she had that glimpse into the crystal ball, she decides to take things into her own hands when husband Isaac is very old, has grown blind, and is preparing to give Esau the firstborn blessing. But Rebekah intervenes and comes up with a deceitful plan for Jacob to trick his blind father so that Jacob receives the blessing instead of Esau. Now Jacob knows full well that this is totally deceitful, but he agrees with Rebekah's plan. So naturally, when Esau finds out that Jacob has received his blessing, he is furious. He goes to his father, upset. Do you only have one blessing, father? Can't you bless me too? And chapter 41, I'm sorry, verse 41 of chapter 27 says, Now Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, The days of mourning for my father are approaching. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. Rebekah finds out about Esau's plan and sends Jacob away, back to their homeland of Haran. So it seems familial relationships continue to not be what God intended for them to be. Jacob flees to Haran where he meets Laban, who is his uncle, and he works seven years for Laban in prepayment to receive Laban's daughter, Rachel, in marriage. Only Laban tricks the trickster and gives Jacob his older daughter, Leah, instead of Rachel. So Jacob works another seven years for Laban and receives Rachel. And then he works another six years before he makes Laban so mad that he has to flee again. So did you add it all up? He was in Haran for 20 years. And when he departs, he has 11 sons. Benjamin, the youngest, has not been born yet. Things are set in motion for Jacob to become the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. But Jacob is afraid to move forward and he can't go back. He is really terrified of meeting his brother Esau. Even after 20 years have passed, he believes that Esau will still want to kill him. 
So he sends messengers ahead to greet Esau, to refer to Esau as their master, and to refer to Jacob as the servant. He asks that Esau be kind, which is somewhat like asking for a blessing, asking for grace asking for something that is not deserved or earned. Only the reply that Jacob gets from the messengers when they return is that Esau does indeed want to meet him and he has 400 men with him. Jacob assumes that means the fight is on. And so it is with this information that Jacob separates himself from his family and the servants and has a dark night of the soul. Have you ever had a dark night of the soul? He is alone with his fear. He is alone with God. He is going to have to face a path he would rather not face. He is going to have to face the unresolved issues of his past before he can move forward. And we have this really strange and mysterious scene of Jacob wrestling with this man slash God. But like Jacob, sometimes we have to face the pain of our past before we can more wholly move into the future. When I was in seminary, I seemed to get the message over and over again from God, what we call a nudging or a whisper of the Holy Spirit. And the message I kept getting was, face the pain. Face the pain of the past from growing up with an alcoholic, abusive father. Face the pain. Yeah, right, that's what I want to do. You? I had successfully buried the past. I had moved on with my life. Only now, looking back on that time, I can see that in order for me to be the best person I could be, the best wife, the best mother, the best friend, the best minister I could be, I needed to face the pain. I needed to allow God to bless me and to truly be healed instead of leaving the pain buried. Because what happens when people are hurt and don't acknowledge and grow from their pain? They go on to hurt others. Face the pain. It is not easy, but it brings the true blessing of healing and wholeness. And so Jacob wrestles with God and it seems he has prevailed. He's holding on once again and he will not let go and demands a blessing. So God, who knows everything, remember he knew Sarah's name last week, asks this week, what is your name? Jacob answers. Then God says, your name won't be Jacob any longer, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and men and won. That is his blessing. That he is no longer the deceitful, heel-grabbing, trickster, supplanter. He is now Israel, which means God. God struggles or one who struggles with God. Which is very interesting that this father of the 12 tribes who near the end of his life will bless his 12 sons is named Israel. Because the whole rest of the Old Testament seems to be the story of God's struggle with a hard-hearted, sinful, prideful people. And the people's struggle with God. But Israel is the chosen and blessed nation. Chosen and blessed to be a blessing to all 
nations. So after his blessing, Jacob slash Israel calls the place Peniel because he has seen the face of God. Face to face with God. Penny is face in Hebrew. El is God. Peniel. And after wrestling with God all night, now Jacob's meeting with Esau is not as formidable. Perhaps he faced his demons. Perhaps he asked for forgiveness and humbled himself. And as it turns out, Esau does act kindly toward Jacob. He has forgiven Jacob, and when they meet, Esau threw his arms around Jacob's neck, kissed him, and wept. Again, a relationship restored. There is forgiveness. There is reconciliation. And that is truly a blessing. But blessings can come at a cost. They are not to be hoarded, but shared. Jacob's struggle came with a cost, too. He would limp for the rest of his life. How do struggles change you? How does struggling with God mark you? You know, just because you are limping doesn't mean you can't move forward. And just because someone else is limping doesn't mean they are not blessed. As we begin our stewardship season, I ask you to think about the ways God has blessed you and consider how God is asking you to be a blessing to others, not just in our church, but in our community. And today especially, I want you to think of a family relationship or a close friend relationship that is strained. In just a little bit during the singing of our hymn, we will invite you to come forward with the ribbon that you were hopefully given as you came in. And I want you to think about that real relationship that could use some kindness. And remember, when Jacob asked Esau to deal kindly with him, that Hebrew word has much deeper meaning than just being nice to someone. It is offering grace, even when you have been wrong. So thinking of a real relationship, think of a kind act that you can do for that person, offering grace. And you will tie your ribbon onto that lattice that we're gonna move to the center. And you're making a visual reminder a covenant, if you will, before God of what you are going to do. And during the prayers, before the hymn, we will have a time of silence for you to think of your person and your kind act. Remember, we are blessed to be a blessing. Let us pray. O oh Lord, our life as disciples is not always an easy one. Strengthen us by your spirit to face the obstacles we encounter and to find encouragement in following the example of those who've gone before us. Lord, in the depths of the hearts, we remember a relationship that is strained and we pray for your spirit to offer grace.
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for those who struggle with their everyday tasks, school children with difficulty learning or making friends, workers in grueling jobs which don't make ends meet, those suffering with chronic pain or facing other insurmountable hurdles. Be the hope of the hopeless and make us ever more vigilant to improve the lives of those within our influence. Jacob was injured by his struggle, but was not defeated by it. Encourage those who bear the scars of struggle and suffering, but who don't have to be defined by their history. Send your spirit of hope and healing to all those who need it. When we consider the struggle of your saints, our own troubles may seem minor by contrast. Nevertheless, draw us all together as your children that we might know life abundant on earth and life eternal in your kingdom. Hear all our prayers, O Lord. Those which we ask this day and those which we dare not speak aloud. May we so trust in you that we never fear to ask anything and never doubt that it is your will to listen and to answer. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. <laughs>